All right, good morning, and we are live, guys. Welcome to Mr. Cantalus Geography of Rome Virtual Field Trip of the City. I'm so excited that you're here today. Uh, we're going to wait a few seconds while we get a few more people in, and then we will get started. So, uh, if you are in the viewership today, make sure you go ahead and leave me a message over in the right hand in the chat bar so I know that you're here. Uh, looking forward to taking you guys on this virtual field trip. Some exciting stuff I wanted to show you guys, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, so I'm going to give you guys a couple seconds to join in and uh, and, and uh, write something in the chat bar. Good morning. How are you guys? And welcome. Good morning, Chris. How are you, buddy? Good morning, Kane. Hey, Gus, good morning. Good morning, Madison. All right, we're getting a lot of people joining in. This is good. Hello there, hello there. All right, we're gonna give everyone a little bit more time. I think I think we'll get probably started here at 8:05. I think that'd be good for us to get started then. Um, in the meantime, I hope you guys are doing well. Been seeing the work. You guys are working hard. I like it. Kane, okay, you read any more books while we've been away? Hey Mitchell, how are you, buddy? Good morning, Talon. You think we'd have any more field trips? Hey, look, Corona may be able to stop us from meeting in class, but it can't stop our class from visiting the world. And with the incredible technologies that we have uh, that are available to us, we should never miss the world. Good morning, Jordan. How are you, buddy? We're going to handful of people joining in this morning. That's good. <laughs> well, thank you, Kane. All right. It's looking like we're getting ready to get started here, guys. Uh, high Faith, good morning. All right, so make sure at the top of your notes you write uh, the geography of Rome. Uh, we're going to learn quite a bit today, and uh, it's going to be good, I promise you. All right, Jordan, I'm doing well, buddy. I'm really excited about this lesson. I'm excited because we're finally in Rome, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. Give it about two more minutes. We're going to see if we can get more people to join. Good morning, Mrs. Ford. Welcome to class today. Good morning, Mark. I got your message on chat. Oh, fantastic. So, Miss Ford, you've been to Rome before. That is awesome. Well, hopefully this tour can live up to, uh, to what you've got to experience. But I'm sure these students would love to hear any personal experiences you've had there. Um, 
I had some good friends that have been to Rome, but I've never been myself. All right, we'll give it about one more minute, guys, and then we will get started. Holy cow, that's incredible. It's a massive city. Uh, they'll really get to see that today, just how big the city is. Um, and they'll actually get to see that from the air. We've got a cool way of showing that. All right, guys, Mark brought up a great point to me. If uh, you can't use the chat bar to communicate with me, you can always contact me through Microsoft Teams. It's still going to pop up in real time, so I will still be able to see your message. Even if you haven't logged into YouTube, I'll still be able to see it, and I'm really excited about that. So it is 8.05. Uh, we got a good group of people in here. Let's go ahead and get started, and I'm so excited that you guys are here with me today because today on 428. I put the wrong date on there. I apologize. On 428-2020, we are talking about the geography of Rome, and we're going to do a virtual field trip of the city. So, uh, welcome to my favorite ancient civilization, Rome. Uh, we've been building up to Rome all year long, and there's a reason we do that. Because every civilization is a little bit older than Rome, but they all give a piece of influence to Roman history. Even if they weren't there at the founding, throughout its time as an empire, Rome is influenced by the places like Jerusalem, like uh, Greece, especially Greece, like Egypt. Rome is influenced by these Mediterranean powers for its entire existence. And so it really starts to develop this uh, multicultural glue that holds the empire together for most of its existence. Now, it does create some tension, but for the most part, the Roman Empire is able to subdue most of the world with little or no issues uh, concerning riots. Part of being brutal enough is people don't tend to fight back. But last we left off, Alexander's empire split in 323 BC following his death. And today we begin the study of Rome in the same way we studied every civilization. And that is my first looking at geography. Today, we're going to look at the geography of the city of Rome itself. Later this week, we're going to look at the geography of the empire, but today specific, specifically, we're looking at the city of Rome. So here's our agenda. We're currently in our welcome. Uh, we're going to go through our objectives, essential questions, standards, and, uh, and expectations here. It's going to take about three minutes. Then we're going to build, begin our field trip as I make a transition from PowerPoint to our virtual field trip aid. And that takes about a one minute. We're going to fly to Rome. We're going to visit the important sites. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to fly over Rome to see the terrain from a bird's eye view. So my expectations. I want you to take notes and pay attention. I want you to ask questions to help us seek a deeper knowledge of topics. I want to make connections to our previous lessons and civilizations. I want to learn something new. And I want to have fun. All right, guys. So those are my expectations. Take, ask, make, learn, have. All right. Understand. All right. Our standards, SS 6.G, 1.1, 1.2, and 1.4. We're going to understand how to use maps and other geographic representation tools and technology to report information. We're going to understand how latitudes and longitudes to find relationships between people and places. We're going to identify wonders of the ancient world, and we're going to utilize Google Earth as a tool to study geography. So those are our standards for today. Our objective is we want to understand how the geography of ancient Rome allowed it to become the largest city in the ancient world. 
our essential question is how does geography affect civilization? Now, I know some of you have answered this question before, and I would love for you to go ahead and give me an answer to this question, either uh, through Microsoft Teams, or you can put down an answer in the chat bar. I'll give you guys a couple seconds. You can do that while we're transitioning. But I want to know, how does geography affect civilization? Think back to our earlier civilizations. Think about the Nile River. Think about the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Mesopotamia, or the Indus River Valley, or the Yellow River in China. How does geography change a civilization? Think about the mountains in Rome. What do those things have to do to change how civilization grows and develops? Where do they become focused? How do they grow? All right, so I want you to really think about geography in the tits of how does it affect civilization and how does it affect the civilizations that we've studied in the past. Good morning, Beryl. Welcome. So we've gone through our welcome. We've talked about our expectations, standards, essential questions, and objectives. I'm going to go ahead and get us ready for our flight. I hope you guys enjoy this. All right. So if you have an answer to those questions, go ahead and put that in the chat bar, or you can put it on Microsoft Teams and send it to me that way. All right. So we are here now on Google Earth, and we're going to start at the very first pin that I have. We are coming to our school. So as we can zoom in, you can see I have a little push pin in the area, Duval Charter School at Coastal, Mr. Canelo's room. So we're going to zoom in. Uh, again, Google Earth still hasn't updated the picture of our school, so it's still missing. But if we click on this little picture, we can see the front of our school or the back of our school, the old car loop. But let's take a click on this. And there's my classroom. All right, you can see my classroom where you guys sit. You can also see uh, Mr. Smith there in the background. These are some of the basketball players uh, watching a movie. So, uh, guys, this is where our home is. This is where we're going to begin our trip. Now, as you may know, we can't just walk to Rome. So, what if we did something else? What if we mm, took a plane and we flew? And I got to pick a plane, guys, that I'm not going to crash immediately. All right. So, we take off from, from near the school. We travel down Beach Boulevard. All right. We're passing over the Walmart. Here in a second. Oops, let me get back. Perfect. Awesome. All right. We are flying over Beach Boulevard and we're heading towards the Atlantic Ocean. And it is so awesome to be able to take this flight with you guys. Get a nice bird's eye view of Jacksonville. We're going to fly over the bridge here and then we'll get out into the ocean. And then we will make our trip across the Atlantic. Gain a little altitude here. We don't want to hit all the cool stuff at Adventure Landing. All right, guys, we're passing over uh, the marinas and the little river, going over the bridge. That's what they call the ditch a lot. If you hear the ditch reference, this is the ditch right here in Jacksonville. A lot of people on the water. We're going to take our speed up a little bit. All right, guys, there is Adventure Landing below us. We're going to go right past the lifeguard station and head out into the Atlantic Ocean where we'll begin our journey to Rome. But I really wanted to show you guys this awesome trip on what it would look like if we just picked up and went from the school. You can see we are getting near the beaches, the lifeguard station. We'll do a low turn out our window. And now we're off. All right. So, as our plane would have gained lots and lots of altitude leaving the school, we can zoom out. We can see the coast of Florida, the United States, the magnitude of the Atlantic Ocean. We're coming towards Africa right now. 
and we can see the boot of Italy. Now, Italy is shaped like a boot. Uh, you can see it here outlined. At the bottom of it is Sicily, and we're going to zoom in just a little bit. Now, Rome is located here on the east side of the of Italy. Uh, Italy is actually a giant peninsula. We remember that term. We use that a lot when we were studying Greece. Italy is also a giant peninsula. It also has peninsulas on it. Um, if you see the area with lots of pins, and I'm actually moving my mouse over that now, uh, that is the city of Rome, all right? And you can see it's some distance away from the coast. In fact, it is roughly, we want to do this in miles from the coast that the Romans would have used to the city of Rome is approximately 15 miles, all right? It's approximately 15 miles. So they were a good distance away from the shoreline, which is actually pretty strategic for the Roman city. It means they're close enough to receive things from port, but they're still far enough away to where it's difficult to offload the boats and run up and attack the city. This was very strategic, and it was more or less by mistake. You see, Rome really wasn't planned to be exactly where it is. In fact, Rome, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, was a swamp. Sorry, yeah, about 4,000 years ago was a swamp. Uh, it was not the best place to pick to live. In fact, the only reason it started that way is because of tradition. Tradition tells us that two young boys who were raised by wolves, washed up on the shores of a small hill, and that is how the Roman uh, civilization was founded, when these two young boys by the name of Romulus and Remus landed uh, on the uh, land near the Tiber River. And that's where we're going to begin. This small river that runs through the middle of Rome, this is called the Tiber River. Now, the Tiber River... Uh, was not used to bring water to Rome. We'll talk about how they bring water to Rome later. But the river uh, served as a great way to uh, agricult to use for agricultural needs, to water the fields, to actually use specifically for bringing boats up from port into the city of Rome. We'll talk about how that was a important, important factor as we they moved forward. But our story really begins as we come to this first hill called Palantine Hill. Now, if you go to Palantine Hill today, what you'll discover is this is a site mostly for um, a lot of the uh, archaeological finds, and we still see that today. If you guys look around it, you'll see a lot of destroyed buildings. We're actually going to go ahead, and we're going to dive in, and we're going to take a street view of Palantine Hill. This is where Rome was founded. It was the first hill that was really uh, founded in Rome. There were seven hills in Rome. Rome was traditionally a swamp. They had to end up draining the water out and damming it up as they grew. But traditionally, Rome was built upon the seven hills, and this is Palatine Hill. And we're going to journey a little bit through Palatine Hill. Um, you can see the different paths that you can take through here. Uh, this is the back side of it. Um, but this is where the palaces were. Uh, some of the more important government buildings were here on Palatine Hill. If this is traditionally where they say Romulus and Remus first started building the wall was around Palatine Hill, and this is it today. All right, so you can go visit it. I believe Miss Ford has visited it, and uh, it is quite a beautiful um, place. It's a really cool place to begin because this is where a lot of the ongoing archaeological digs are taking place here in the city. And you can see the Roman architecture, of course, the... Uh, arches. A lot of Rome has been destroyed, but we still have traces of the past everywhere in that city. You can't go anywhere in Rome without noticing something of the past. Alright, and here we are again. These incredibly large arches, uh, large infrastructure. The Roman style is very much similar to the Greek style, and a little bit of their own. Uh, the Romans are really good about taking other people's stuff and stealing it. All right, they're very, very, very good at that. So they like adapting other cultures to their own. 
Okay, guys, so that's the street view of Palantine Hill. Um, next, we are going to talk about uh, one of the coolest structures in Rome, and we're right next to it. And that, my friends, is the Colosseum. So we're going to take a pic look at some pictures that people have taken of the Colosseum. Now, the Colosseum was originally designed as a place where the games could be competed. Now, now those aren't games that we play anymore these days. These games were used uh, as a form of execution, and sometimes, uh, sometimes it was a very bloody sport. Um, but this is where the uh, Colosseum, this is the inside the Colosseum as it is today. Certainly not what it looked like thousands of years ago. Thousands of years ago, the sides would have been covered uh, in chairs, so all this area would have had seating, uh, not chairs, but uh, benches, bleachers, would have been covering the walls here. Uh, up at the very top, there would have been big poles that suspended giant tarps to keep the people nice and cool. Uh, the richer you were, the, high, uh, the, uh, the closer you were, the poorer you were, the higher up you were. The Romans used the Colosseum specifically for entertainment of the masses, all right? Rome had over a million people at its height. And so to keep people interested, they had these games. The idea was, hey, if they're not going to be, um, you know, these people have really nothing to do, we need to give them something to entertain them so that they don't riot and destroy everything. Taking a look farther down, uh, you can see the grass under here. You can see under what the floor would have been. All right, so you see our level where we're at, where we're standing. That would have extended flat across the Colosseum. Underneath would have been filled with trap doors and secret passageways that they could open up the floor and move things in and off of the arena floor. So uh, there have been trap doors to let up lions or tigers up into the Colosseum, into the fighting. Um, but one of the really cool features of the Colosseum is they were able to fill it with water. They could have a naval battle inside the Colosseum, and it was incredible. Um, it's one of the more impressive things about this, uh, this, this stadium, is how advanced they were in creating it. They had concession stands. You could get information, you could get uh, souvenir type things from your favorite gladiators. All of this was available. They would reenact battles inside the Colosseum. This was a great place to study the Roman history, but also it was a place where they had executions. It was, yes, just like a baseball stadium, an early baseball stadium, except a lot, a lot, a lot more dangerous. But it really was quite an exceptional place. Even the Roman emperor would come and watch the games here. All right, so that is the Colosseum. And Ms. Ford made a great point. There is a false floor. We're actually standing on the false floor. And underneath that, animals and people uh, and they were part of sports. They had elevators. They would move things up and down. And they were able to change the arena whenever they needed to, like fill it with water and put uh, ships on it for a battle. All right, exiting the Colosseum. Next, we are going to travel to the Castle San Angelo. Now, the Castle San Angelo is actually a little bit old, uh, newer than most of the other things we have studied so far. But the Castle San Angelo actually plays an important point. Originally, the Castle San Angelo was built to protect the city of Rome. It was fortifications for the elite. Uh, they could come to this place if they needed defense. We're going to enter the street view here. So we can see the Castle San Angelo. Um, it was a very strong fortification. It used the river and it controlled this bridge to prevent people from attacking it. But in its primary function as Rome began to grow um, throughout the years was to protect the Pope. So it's a very important place when it comes to protecting the Pope. In fact, this, uh, what looks like an aqueduct, is actually a passageway. All right? It looks like an aqueduct is actually a passageway, and it travels from the Vatican. And we're going to travel to the Vatican now. It travels from the Vatican to the, uh, to the Castle San Angelo uh, to keep the Pope safe. And speaking of the Pope, here we are in Vatican Square. And we'll get our street view here in a second why it's doing that. Let's look at a picture. Awesome. There we go. Let's 
not wanting to participate with us guys. Sorry about that. This is the Vatican. All right, and so this is a very important spot. The Vatican is the seat of the Catholic Church in the world. So this is where the Pope lives. Um, this is his church right here. Uh, it's an important site because the church in the Vatican was built on the traditional grounds of uh, it was called the Basilica San um, San Pietro or the Basilica of Saint Peter. It's built where Saint Peter was likely executed by the Romans in around thirty nine BC, forty B or forty AD, thirty nine AD, um, and so they built this church on top of that spot as kind of a way of honoring Peter, but it was a very important spot. Even before this was a very important spot for the Romans, this was a temple for their gods, also an execution place for dissidents. So uh, this was a very important place. Uh, it's also known as the Holy See, H-O-L-Y-S-E-E. -E. It's also known as the Vatican. Okay, So it's a very important religious place that we take a quick look at. Now we're going to another place of entertainment. And that is the Circus Maximus, and you can still see it today. It's located very close to the Colosseum and very close to Palatine Hill. All right. This is the Circus Maximus. And the Circus Maximus, guys, was a racetrack. You can still kind of see the lines in the ground today. Um, it would have been a place for chariots, and there's lots of great movies that show chariot racing. Um, the movie Ben-Hur is a great example of that. All right, so this is where the racing would have taken place. This hill right here would have been bleachers. Uh, it was torn down after a while. But this is where the chariot racing in Rome took place out here on the Circus Maximus. You can even go today and check out the Circus Maximus. You can get down here and walk the course that the Romans used to run. Uh, it would have been quite an amazing thing to see those chariots racing around at really, really high speeds, trying to cut these really sharp corners as they'd sprint down and around. Um, it would have been quite an impressive place. So this is called the Circus Maximus. All right. Next, we're going to go to the Curia Julia. Oh. The Curia Julia is also known as the Roman Forum. This was where... Uh, the government of Rome was formed. So let's see if we can get into our street view or ground view. This site is a little tricky, if I remember correctly. I'll show you guys some pictures as we're down here. So this is where the Roman Forum was. Um, this is where their government met. So when the uh, city of Rome was founded, this is where all of the uh, government officials came. This is where the Senate came to meet and debate and they formed a form of democracy. It really wasn't as democratic as we would hope, but it is here at the Circus Julia that the government officials really did their work. Um, it is here that Caesar is murdered. Julius Caesar is murdered, bringing about the beginning of the Roman Empire. And so this is a, a very important spot for the ancient city um, I think it serves a great lesson on what Rome really, really uh, aspired to do and what they couldn't do, right? They really wanted to be a democracy like Athens. They tried it. It just didn't work out. It could never really take root here. And we'll talk about that more as we keep moving along. Um, we're going to talk about the Arch of Titus. Titus was an emperor in Rome. Uh, the Arch of Titus was built to celebrate him. It's really close to the Colosseum, and we'll actually go check out the street view here. Here we go. This is the Arch of Titus. I know, ooh, I know it's a little pixelated right now. Um, it will work its way out eventually. Uh, this is the Arch of Titus. In the distance, you can see the Colosseum rising above. The Arch of Titus will actually lead us back onto Palatine Hill, um, and you can go left here. And that would take you to the Circus Maximus eventually. So uh, this, if we can turn around again, is the Arch of Titus, Mac, uh, of, um, Titus 
Here's a good picture of it, if I can get it to load it. Oh, it won't load it. All right. We'll skip that for now. Okay, and we're going to travel back to uh, Capitolone Hill. Capitolone Hill is now the capital hill of Rome. This is another site of a lot of uh, architecture and uh, archaeological projects. This was a spot of government buildings. It still is today. Um, you can see this incredible fountain out in front. The goddess Athena uh, for wisdom and grace in the ruling. We're actually going to travel this way. Check out more ruins. So again, uh, these are the hills, and I, I want to really express to you, when we talk about the hills of Rome, they're really not that tall, all right? Uh, this is the hill. It really isn't that much taller than the area surrounding it. Uh, but they made good defensible structures so that when Rome was originally founded, they could just defend the hills. They didn't have to defend the rest of the area, and that really allowed Rome to grow. All right, I'm going to show you two more things, and then we'll do a sky-eye view as I continue to talk a little bit about Rome as it is. So this is the Pantheon. Uh, Pantheon. Um, this is one of the older buildings in Rome. Uh, originally it started out as a temple to the um, Roman gods who were also the Greek gods. The Romans copied that and renamed them. So Zeus became Jupiter, so on and so forth. All right, this is the Pantheon. It's really quite a fascinating building. Um, we'll scoot a little bit closer to it. It has an open hole in the top. They never filled it in. Uh, that is to let in sunlight and air. <laughs> it actually rains in there. They had to slant the floors down inside the Pantheon to allow the water to drain out. The Christians converted this into a church after they took over Rome, but it is quite a fascinating building. If we look up at these columns, we have a specific column design. Does anyone know... Um, what that type of column is. I know we've been over this before. We covered this in Greece. I'd love to see if someone can remember what type of columns these are. We have three types. Ionic, Doric, and Corinthian. What type of columns are these? I would love to see an answer in the chat bar. Viral, I need you to pay attention. What type of columns are we looking at, guys? Does anyone remember? Ionic. Close. It's not ionic. I see where you're going with that. It is not Doric. Remember, Doric is very, very plain. It, remember, Doric are very plain and they're rolled. These look very ornate. They look like there's a lot of design in them. So what can they be? We're getting there. All right, guys, remember, these are Corinthian columns. These are Corinthian columns. All right? Corinthian columns are very... Uh, beautiful, they're very um, ornate in their structures. All right, Corinthian, very good, Dinar. All right, so up top it says uh, M A Grippa um, Ifa Coster uh, Tivum uh, Fisit. This just says um, that this building was built by Marcus Agrippa in his third term as the uh, consul of Rome. So the third consulship of Rome. He built this building. A consul was like a king, but it was an elected position, or pretty much appointed position, and you served for a short period of time. And during his third consulship 
Mar Marcus Agrippa built this building. All right, he had this building constructed. That's what that is saying in Latin. Uh, it's actually really cool because you get to see how Latin is put together. Um, sometimes there's spaces in between the words. Sometimes there's not. And so if you study Latin, you have to learn to look for these dots. So if we look up top and you see the I dot F dot coast or cost dot, those are all um, saying that there's a break in between those words. The I and the F is referring specifically to a person, and so is the M and the, a, uh, the M. Um, it's referring to Marcus, and then Agrippa would be his last name. And it's saying he's, son, he's the son of Lucius, um, and I forgot Lucius' was his last name, and he built this building during his third year of his reign. All right, very cool. Okay, guys, now I want to show you one more thing. Uh, I told you before they did not get their water from the uh, river. They actually got them from somewhere else. And we're going to go take a look at those now. All right. So what we are standing underneath right now, this is called an aqueduct. The aqueducts brought water into Rome. It actually brought in a lot, a lot of water. There's many aqueducts that enter the city of Rome. This is the Aqua Claudia, built after Emperor Claudia. Um, it would bring fresh water to Rome from the mountains outside. And they always have a small slope downward. So the entire route, these aqueducts are bringing water from other places to Rome. So it brought Rome lots and lots of fresh water. Uh, it was the water was pretty high up, so it made it difficult to contaminate. If any of them were contaminated, the Romans could just switch to a different source. It was a great way to bring water into the city and keep them fresh that way. Even if they were put under siege, if somebody attacked the city, they'd have water coming in from somewhere else. They couldn't just poison the river. So the Romans were very, in, in, very, very intelligent in building these aqueducts. Um, they carried water from many, many, many miles away into the city of Rome. All right, so now that we've talked about Rome, what I would love to do with you guys is I would love to give you a bird's eye view. This is the last thing we're going to do today. Um, I want to give you a bird's eye view of the city of Rome uh, so that you can get an idea. And I'm actually going to back up a little bit because I don't want to crash as soon as I launch this thing. All right. Um, forgive me if I do. Okay. All right. So here we are in Rome. Give me a second to uh, get us situated here. All right, we're taking a look here at Rome itself, um, and I want you to really get a good look at the terrain. Outside of Rome, we can see small rolling hills. We can see lots and lots of grass. That's important. Rome had a extremely lush surrounding area. Italy is a great place to grow. Unlike Greece, if we remember thinking back at Greece, remember Greece was covered in Rocky Mountains. That is not the case here. In Italy, they have incredible uh, land to grow on. Some of the most fertile land in the ancient world. Now, it wasn't replenished by um, floods like the Nile River was, but this river is covered in lush grasses, uh, and they were able to grow lots and lots of olive trees. I've told you before, olives were really important in the ancient world. They weren't only used to make food, they were or to uh, flavor food or to cook with. They were used for lighting. And in fact, the Romans used them for um, for for bathing, okay? They would bathe with olive oil. Remember I told you, they would kind of cover their body up and then they'd just scrape it off and it'd bring all the dirt with them. I know it sounds gross and everyone would end up smelling like olive oil, but the Romans brought in millions and millions of uh, pounds of olive oil a year. In fact, we can go and explore massive piles of broken jars where these things were cool. Um, so Rome is a massive city today. And anyone can tell you, uh, it, it really is a massive city. But even back then, it was incredible. Let me tell you a story. With this many people, with over a million people, there has to be a lot of waste, right? A lot of human waste, okay? Uh, and so how would the Romans have taken care of all of this? Because you don't want people getting sick and dying. You don't want disease breaking out. So what the Romans did is they built one of the most advanced sewer systems in the world. In fact, in the 1990s, the Romans were redoing their old sewer system that they had built following the Second World War, and they dug a little bit too deep, and they came into a chamber that was over 10 feet tall, 
and it was much deeper than they thought. It was about 30 feet deep. This was the Roman sewer, and it was still working. The ancient Roman sewer was still working uh, today. So it actually was quite an engineering feat. It kept all the people, um, it, it kept all the human waste out of the city, and uh, it made it very easy for the population there to live. So they had to feed a lot of people in Rome. They had to maintain it. And we're talking a million people. When I say there was a million people living in the ancient city, that's a million Roman citizens, okay? Uh, we're loading a little slow, guys. I'm sorry about that. It should be a little bit clearer as we fly over. There we go. So over a million people, that was citizens. That doesn't include the massive amount of slaves that would have been living in the city at the time, okay? So Rome really is a cool city. I highly suggest you go check it out. Um, that's going to conclude our flight around Rome. Um, I just really wanted to show you guys the terrain. Remember, it's built on seven hills, and those hills aren't very tall. So this city really doesn't have much... Uh, it doesn't really have the um, major rivers that they use for resources. They have one river that bring in resources, but it... If we look at it compared to other civilizations, it's not limited. We look at ancient uh, Mesopotamia, remember they're limited because there's people nearby them. When Rome was founded, there really was no other major city-states in the area. When Rome was founded, there really was some very cool, um, very cool uh, ways of building up a civilization without really being affected. All right, so I got a question about what the magic word is. All right, the magic word for today, which I'm actually going to have you guys fill out uh, on a go formative. It's only going to be a one question go formative. It is an exit ticket, though. Our uh, magic word for the day is Pantheon, okay? Pantheon. And I'm going to show you guys what that looks like again. All right, Pantheon, P A N T H E. O-N, Pantheon, is the magic word for the day, okay? Pantheon. And when we're talking about Pantheon, we're talking about this building right here. Okay, guys, so um, that is it for our uh, our excursion, but I need to get you back to this. So um, what we've done is we've done our virtual field trip. We've done our fly to Rome. We've done our visit important sites. We've done a fly over of Rome, and we saw the terrain from a bird's eye view. Now I need to introduce to you the map project. All right, so for our map project, you're going to label the blank map that I've attached to your assignments in Microsoft Teams. Follow directions that are written on the page. If you have any questions, I'm available from now until 9.30, and then again from 1 to 2. Remember to write down your magic word on your paper. That's actually changing. You're going to write down your magic word on the go formative. So uh, in the assignment that I've assigned to you, let me show it to you guys again. Um, Let me pull that up for you guys real quick. Give me one second. This is the assignment. It's a Roman geography practice quiz. Guess what, guys? You're going to have a quiz on Thursday. So you're going to follow this link to the practice quiz. You can play the quiz online, or you can use one of the attached practice maps. Uh, so you can follow this website to the quiz. Um, I'm going to click on that real quick. I'm going to open it up. Now, this is a practice map. Okay, this is a practice map, so you're going to be practicing this on your own. Um, I'm not going to be going over this with you guys, so you're going to be doing this on your own. Um, but I want you to really study it because this is the material we're going to be going over for the quiz on Thursday. All right? Sorry, I had to close some things out. Got a lot going on in the background today. <laughs> Sit. It's not happy with me. 
All right, we'll try it again. All right, this is what the document is going to look like. This is just a better way to do it. The website you can actually fill in on your own. All right, you're going to have different numbers. You're going to have to match those up, all right, um, and figure out what those things are. Some of them are places. Here we go. It's up. All right, so let's do it real quick as an example. I'm going to click Start. It's going to ask me where the Adriatic Sea is. So i got to figure out where the Adriatic Sea is. Well, I know the Adriatic Sea is located in between Italy and the rest of mainland Europe. All right, now i got to find Britain. So i got to write. It gave me a green. Britain is a small island north of Europe. I'm going to click on that. It's now green. So this is how we are going to do. i got to find Greece. Well, I know where Greece is. All right, I gotta find the Italian Alps. Alps, Alps, Alps. <laughs> They're up there. All right, Sardinia. Sardinia is an island located off of uh, Italy. Oh, I missed it. I picked Corsica instead. All right, guys. So you're gonna use this quiz to help you study for the quiz, or this practice to help you study for the quiz. It will be a good formative up at ten o'clock. All right. That is your map quiz and project. Are there any questions? It's a map of the Roman Empire, uh, Val. So remember, there's a difference between Rome, the city, and Rome, the empire, uh, or Rome, the uh, the republic. All right, we're looking at the much larger map, Rome, the republic. All right, questions, anybody? Valeria, you asked how to spell Pantheon, P-A-N-T-H-E-O-N, Pantheon. All right, any questions? All right, guys, looking for questions. If I have none, all right. Exactly how fast do the chariots go? Well, Chariot's Barrel could get up to around 20 to 30 miles per hour. In a race like that, um, in the long stretches, they'd get up to their full speed. It just really depends on the horses and the weight of the driver. But they get up to full speed. Uh, but again, there's those corners, so they'd have to definitely slow down in order to make those. Um, otherwise, if you don't slow down enough, Chariot's aren't the most stable, and they would flip over and throw their drivers. Uh, so it could be pretty dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. And they raced those things to the max. They treated it like it was life or death. All right, guys, any questions? Seeing that there are none right now, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be switching over to live. Uh, I'm going to end this stream. I'm going to switch over to live. You can ask me questions there until 930. All right, this way this video can go ahead and get posted. And so people that missed it at the start are able to catch up. All right, guys, I'll be switching over now. I'll see you soon.